All right, so what I want to show you is actually how to construct a, a snark. Um, I think it's a pr pretty cool construction. The only thing that I'm a little bit nervous about is I tried and tried and tried to pack things into an hour lecture. Hopefully, I can, I can do it in an hour, and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But I want to make, I'll talk fast, but I want to make sure everything is clear. So if, please, please, if I say something that's not immediately clear, please ask a question, because I do want to make sure everything is clear and everybody's following. All right, so first of all, kind of building on what Ellie said, uh, the, I want to just mention the general paradigm for building snarks. So we kind of combine two different things. Yeah, so even a more general paradigm than this, uh, what, what we do is we uh, build what's called a functional commitment scheme that allows us to commit to functions in, in a particular family of, uh, of functions. And then later, the, in, a commit, in a functional commitment scheme, we can, open, we can ask the prover to open the function at a particular point. Yeah, so that's a functional commitment scheme. Uh, and then we're going to, so that actually gives us a, already a snark, but only for a very restricted family of functions. And then we combine this with an, with an information theoretic object called uh, an interactive oracle proof or a functional interactive oracle proof. And the functional interactive oracle proof boosts the functional commitment scheme into a complete snark. The example we're going to see here is we're going to start from a functional commitment scheme that lets us commit to univariate polynomials. Yeah, there are other functional commitment schemes, like commitment schemes that commit to multilinear polynomials, multivariate polynomials. Here, we're going to start from a a functional commitment scheme that lets us commit to univariate polynomials of bounded degree. And we're going to combine that with, uh, with a polynomial interactive oracle proof, and together these things will basically give us, give us uh, the snark for general circuits. Now, I want to say this is a cryptographic object. It depends on, um, let's just say, certain strong cryptographic assumptions. And uh, this is an information theoretic object, so nice and clean, and it's all algebra and math. And in fact, in most of the talk, I'm going to focus on the lifting step, the IOP. But before I can do that, I do, I do need to remind you what, an, uh, what a polynomial commitment scheme is. We saw it in Ellie's talk, but let me quickly just review this to make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah, so it allows us to commit to a polynomial F of bounded degree, so FP less than D means a polynomial in the finite field FP of degree at most D. These are univariate polynomials. And after we commit to the, uh, after the prover commits to the polynomial, we can actually, allow, we enable uh, the prover uh, to prove the following statement, basically given, a val given values u and v, the prover should be able to convince the verifier that a, f of u is equal to v, f is the committed polynomial, and b, the degree of the committed polynomial is at most d. Okay, that, so these two facts are really quite crucial. That's what a polynomial com commitment scheme uh, lets us do. And just to be clear, the public statement here is the degree bound, the verifier, of course, has the commitment to the polynomial, and the verifier has the values u and v. Again, the prover is convincing the verifier that the committed polynomial uh, satisfies f of u is equal to v. And the requirement, of course, I mean, this would not be very interesting. The prover could just send the polynomial over to the verifier. Right, that's kind of a trivial way to prove this fact of the verifier. But then we add these succinctness constraints to say that um, the evaluation proof and the verifier's time should both be at most logarithmic in the degree v. Again, if you think about this for a minute, it's kind of remarkable that this is possible. I can have a, a polynomial, I can commit to a polynomial of degree 1 million, and I can convince you that the polynomial at the point 3 evaluates to 5 using a tiny proof that's really fast uh, to verify. Yeah, so this is quite a powerful uh, primitive, and that's actually um, the underlying, one of the underlying building blocks towards uh, going towards the snark. Now, just as a notational point of view, what I'm, I'm going to denote, instead of writing com sub f for the commitment to the polynomial, I'm going I'm to write f in a box to denote the commitment to the polynomial. And in fact, when we talk about in the abstract complexity settings, you should be thinking of f in a box as sort of an oracle for the function f that anyone can query at any given point. Okay, uh, and I just wanted to also mention polynomial commitment schemes are kind of, they're kind of magical objects. They have so many applications, it's kind of crazy. Like, uh, they have very clean, um, they, 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 they kind of give drop-in replacements for Merkle trees with lots and lots of benefits. In fact, the new buzzword is what's called a Merkle tree, which is a Merkle tree built from polynomial commitments with all the, um, with all the benefits that come from that. Um, and so, just so you know, PCSs are not just for snarks. They have lots of other applications, but today we're just going to focus on their application to snarks. So just to give a few examples, um, let's see. So we can, so as Ellie mentioned, we can build them from, bil from bilinear groups. There's the KZG construction, a constant size commitment, constant size evaluation proof, 
constant time for the verifier to verify. Constant meaning independent of the degree of the polynomial. Kind of a remarkable thing that this is possible. The only downside is it requires a trusted setup. Yeah, so somebody has to run um, a setup procedure that has some secret random bits, and those random bits must not be revealed uh, to the public. Otherwise, you can generate false proofs. Yeah, if I can generate false proofs, I can steal money. So generating false proofs is a disaster, and so we have to make sure this trusted setup really is uh, trusted. There's another version using bilinear groups. There's a very beautiful construction. I highly encourage you to read this paper. It's quite, quite pretty. Uh, the Dory construction, which actually has uh, same, so constant size commitment, logarithmic size evaluation proofs, logarithmic time for the verifier, so a little bit worse than KZG. KZG was constant, Dory is logarithmic, but it does all that uh, without a trusted setup. Yeah, so now no trusted setup at all, which is super cool. Uh, using just elliptic curves, so no bilinear groups, uh, just regular elliptic curves. Uh, there is uh, uh, the bulletproof construction, um, which actually has short proofs, but unfortunately the verifier time is linear in the degree of the polynomial. Uh, so this leads to uh, snarks where verification actually is, uh, is not succinct. It takes, takes uh, linear time in the size of the circle, circuit. Ailey showed us how to build polynomial commitment schemes from FRI, and there's another construction uh, called DARK from uh, groups of unknown order. So you can use RSA groups, you can use uh, class groups, um, and so on. Also a very elegant construction that's, uh, that's very cute. Yeah, so these are examples of polynomial commitment schemes that we have. Um, the main one that's used in practice is KZG because everything's constant. People like it, and so they swallow the, the um, uh, trusted setup, but then everything else is constant. All right, that's all I'm gonna say about polynomial commitments, and now I wanna switch gears and uh, start working towards uh, building a snark, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is not worry about snarks at all. I'm just gonna talk about how to prove properties of committed polynomials. Yeah, so the prover commits to some polynomial, and it wants to prove properties of this polynomial. So the way I'm gonna describe this is uh, like this. So here's like an abstract description of what does it mean to prove properties of committed polynomials. The prover has some polynomials in the clear, the verifier has some committed polynomials, yeah, so polynomials in a box. Uh, again, you can think of these as oracles, uh, but, or you can think of these as commitments if you want to be concrete. And the prover just wants to convince the verifier that F and G satisfy some properties. And we'll see in a minute uh, what I mean by that. The way this is going to work um, is I'll describe this as kind of an, uh, what's called an interactive oracle proof, an IOP, uh, where basically we'll just say, you know, the verifier is going to send some randomness to the prover. Uh, the prover is going to send back some commitments to some polynomials. Um, you know, either commitments or actually oracles to these polynomials. Again, you can think of it either as commitments or oracles to polynomials. Um, the uh, verifier will then query these, uh, these polynomials, F, G, and Q, and then finally decide to accept or reject. Of course, when we compile this into an actual protocol, yeah, when we compile this to a protocol, what will happen is V will send uh, X, uh, what is this, v, v would send R to the prover, and then the prover will respond with F of R along with an evaluation proof that F of R was actually evaluated correctly. Yeah, so when I say query F of X, uh, or query F at the point R, uh, what that means is uh, verifier sends R to the prover, the prover responds with F of R along with an evaluation proof to prove that the polynomial was evaluated correctly. So again, uh, here's our uh, canonical example. I'm gonna go through this quickly because Ellie explained this too. Um, suppose the prover has F and G, the verifier has commitments to F and G, oracles for F and G, and what the prover wants to convince the verifier is that these two polynomials are equal. Can somebody tell me what's the protocol for this? How do you prove the two polynomials are equal very quickly? Just shout it out. Perfect, exactly right. Uh, so you verifier chooses a, ran chooses a random points, query, uh, queries F and G at the point R, it learns F, R, and G, R, and then it accepts if F of R is equal to G, R. Yeah, trivial protocol. And as Ellie mentioned, this has soundness uh, D over P. So as long as D is small relative to P, uh, everything is, uh, we're all happy, this, this, is, this is a sound protocol. When we compile this into an actual protocol, yeah, just to, I wanna make sure the compilation step is clear. When you compile this into an actual protocol, what happens is, again, you send R to the prover, the prover evaluates, and then it sends back the evaluation points, one, Y, evaluation values, Y and Y prime, along with the evaluation proofs that, that uh, Y and Y prime were computed correctly. Then uh, the verifier will accept if Y is equal to Y prime, and both evaluation proofs are correct. Yeah, so the compiled protocol also includes the evaluation proofs. Um, and of course, you notice that um, 
this is a this is a public coin protocol. Public coin protocol. The only thing the verifier contributes is just random bits, and because it's a public coin protocol, we can apply fiat Shamir to it, um, and that makes this protocol into a non-interactive system in in the random oracle model. Uh, by the way, I think somebody asked in the last lecture um, about interactive proofs. Um, you know that if the protocol is not a public coin protocol, that is, if the verifier has to keep secrets. We can't apply fiat Shamir to this protocol, and those are inherently interactive protocols. Yeah, they cannot be made uh, non-interactive. So secret coin protocols cannot be made non-interactive, and there's a whole line of work on trying to optimize um, uh, uh, interact, you know, secret coin protocols and trying to make those as efficient as possible. In this talk, we're mostly going to focus on snarks. The world of blockchains mostly needs non-interactive protocols. The reason we need non-interactive protocols is because there's typically one prover and many verifiers. Yeah? If, you had, if you were using an interactive protocol, the prover would have to separately generate a proof for each verifier. Yeah, by making these proofs non-interactive, we can have many verifiers verify a single proof, and the prover only needs to operate once, which is why the blockchain space mainly uses public coin protocols, which can be made non-interactive using fiat Shamir. Okay. Good. So I want to now uh, go skip ahead and talk about very important proof gadgets that uh, are going to let us build a snark. So what are these uh, proof gadgets? These are, again, for univariate polynomials. So Ellie called this set H. I like to call this set omega. Uh, so we're going, to let's, we're going to fix some set omega to be a, a, a subset of the finite field. Let's say that it has size k. So omega, subset of, F of p of uh, size k. And suppose we have a polynomial f of degree at most d. Uh, that, that, we, that the verifier, that the prover has committed to, so the verifier has an oracle to F or a commitment to F, uh, has F in a box, okay? Uh, the three things that the prover would like to prove to the verifier are the following. These are kind of uh, very important building blocks in this entire space. The first one is what's called a zero test. Ellie already mentioned this, that we'd like to prove that the committed polynomial is identically zero on the entire set omega. Zero test, okay? The second thing is called a sum check where we'd like to prove that the sum of the elements uh, over omega of f of a, say, is equal to zero. I want to, when we talk about sum checks, I just want to make sure you're not, uh, don't confuse this. Uh, there are multivariate sum checks that are, those are different protocols. Here I'm referring to a univariate sum check. Yeah, these are univariate polynomials. This is different from the classic sum check protocol. It's a sum check on a univariate polynomial where we're just proving that the sum of the elements um, over, over, uh, over the set omega happens to be equal to zero. And similarly, there's a product check where we're proving that the product of the elements over omega is equal to one. Okay, so these are three basic building blocks, zero test, sum check, product check. Everybody okay with this? Yeah, please. Is the degree of f exactly d, or is it just an upper bound? Upper bound, always upper bound. So is it more than k? Well, look, if the degree of f is less than k, then this is not a very interesting, then the zero check is not a very interesting problem, because if it's zero, if, it, if its degree is less than k, so the degree is less than the size of omega, and it's zero in all of omega, then it must be the zero polynomial. And then we can easily test that it's a zero polynomial by evaluating at a random point. If the degree of f is bigger than the size of omega, it could be zero on all of omega, but non-zero everywhere else. And that, then it's an interesting problem. Then you can't just evaluate at a random point, we have to do something more sophisticated, okay? So typically, we'll be applying these things to polynomials that are bigger than the size of the set omega. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a very good point. Okay, good. So uh, again, this is a, so everybody okay with these three? Just remember these names. These are pretty built, basic building blocks that come up in a lot, of different, a lot of different snarks. And we have efficient protocols for all of them. I'll show you some of them. So the first thing, as Ellie also defined, we have to define the vanishing polynomial. I'll go through this quickly. So again, we have our set omega, which is a subset of the finite field. The vanishing polynomial is a polynomial basically that has, that is zero on the entire set. Yeah, it's not a zero polynomial, but it is zero on the entire set, and this is basically how it's defined. Its degree, of course, is the size uh, of the set. Um, and one thing that I want to mention is that um, there is a convenient set capital omega which is defined by the roots of unity. So if capital omega <clears throat> happens to be a multiplicative subgroup of the finite field, in other words, um, capital omega happens to be powers of a kth root of unity, yeah, so powers of a primitive uh, kth root of unity. This is, by the way, why I use capital omega, so 
little omega is a kth root of unity, capital omega is a set of all powers, it's a subgroup uh, generated by uh, little omega, then of course the vanishing polynomial becomes x to the k minus one, and then this is a polynomial that's very easy to evaluate, right? We can evaluate this polynomial, the vanishing polynomial at any point using only log k arithmetic operations. This is, by the way, why we like the set capital omega. We could apply this, everything I say, we can apply to any set, set capital omega, this particular set capital omega is great because it has an easy to evaluate vanishing polynomial. Okay, so that's the vanishing polynomial, uh, right. Um, so the first thing I'll do is repeat what Ellie said. This is such an, the zero test is such an important protocol that I wanna make sure it's clear and burned into your minds, yeah? So I'll repeat this, Ellie already showed you this protocol, but I'll very quickly uh, repeat what it is. So the situation here is again, the prover has a polynomial F, uh, the verifier has a commitment, an oracle for the polynomial f. Um, and there's this lemma that says that, um, yeah, we want to prove that f is zero on all of capital omega. The lemma says if f is zero on capital omega, if and only if f is divisible by the vanishing polynomial of omega. Yeah, this is a pretty simple uh, lemma to prove, as Ellie already mentioned. I'm just going to repeat the, the protocol very quickly. So we compute the quotients. We know that if the statement is true, this quotient is going to be a polynomial. And then we're gonna make the prover commit to this polynomial. Now you remember, this is a polynomial commitment scheme. You can only commit to polynomials up to degree D, yeah? So if the statement was false, this Q would be a rational function or a non-trivial rational function. It would have a denominator. And then the poor prover couldn't commit to this Q. Yeah, so you can only commit to it if it's actually a polynomial. So if the vanishing polynomial divides F, um, then we'll evaluate, the verifier will send a random point, query Q and F at this random point, and we'll learn QR and FR, and then it will accept if FR is equal to QR times the vanishing polynomial, right? This proves um, if this equality holds, we have the polynomial on the left is equal to the polynomial on the right at a random point. That proves that with high probability, these, the polynomial on the left is equal to the polynomial of the, on the right as polynomials, right? They're equal at a random, random point, Therefore, they're very high probability, they're equal as polynomials, and that proves that F is divisible by the vanishing polynomial, and therefore F must be zero on omega. Yeah, that's the zero test. And you notice the only thing the verifier has to do here is just evaluate the vanishing polynomial, but because we use an easy to evaluate vanishing polynomial, this can be done, in, uh, in, this can be done quite quickly, right? So it's, the protocol is complete and sound. Um, and uh, the running time is, the verifier's running time is uh, log k. What's interesting is if, if you think about the prover's running time, yeah, what does the prover have to do here? The prover actually has to work, the prover has to do some work here. The prover in particular has to compute the polynomial q, yeah, so it has to divide two polynomials. So that's interesting, how long does it take to do this division? Uh, that depends on how the polynomials are represented. Yeah, so let's not talk about that today. Uh, although that's an interesting question, it has to, commit, has to compute the polynomial, and then it has to commit to the polynomial. Yeah, and uh, that also takes some work. So I'll say that the prover's time, I'm not gonna be explicit here, I'll say it's dominated by the time to compute the polynomial Q and commit to the polynomial Q. Often, often this is the reason, computing this Q, is the reason why these algorithms run in quasi-linear time, uh, you know, d log d, or k log k, as opposed to actual linear time, namely k. Yeah, this, this uh, computing and committing uh, the, the quotient polynomial. Okay, so that's the zero test. Everybody okay with this? This you already saw an hour ago. Oh, question, please. Yeah, it's a question for me, but how does the verifier know that Q is actually Q? Oh, it doesn't. This is why it's doing this check. So it's actually evaluating it at a random point. Of course, it doesn't know that Q is Q. The, well, how does it know that Q was computed that actually divided by Z? No, it doesn't. The prover could have easily com committed to garbage. That's easily true. Can I commit to F? Yeah, of course you can commit to F, but then the, the equality is not gonna hold. Oh, because I know Z, okay. Yeah, 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 I know the verifier, this is why it's very important that the verifier evaluate Z by itself. It can't trust anyone to verify Z. It has to evaluate Z by itself. Yeah, so very good, I'm glad you asked. It's a very, very good point. Okay, so that's the, uh, so how are we doing on time? Ah, making good time, uh, good progress. Okay, so that's the zero test, uh, which by now I hope is kind of uh, drilled into, uh, into everybody's minds. It's a very important uh, protocol. The next one I, to I told you was what? That was the sum test, sum check, right? So verify that the sum over omega, I'm not gonna show you the sum check, I'm, only gonna, I'm actually gonna show you the project, product check instead. It turns out I'm gonna leave you as a, to, to, to uh, uh, come up with a sum check protocol uh, as a homework assignment. It's literally the same as the product check. The, those two protocols are basically the same. Um, 
So how do we do a product check? So we want to prove that the product of all the, uh, the, of all the evaluations of the polynomial over the set capital omega is equal to 1. How do we do that? So here's what we're doing. We're going we're to do. We're going to define an auxiliary polynomial, which I'll call T. This auxiliary polynomial is going define, to be defined as follows. So we'll define T of 1 to be F of 1. Okay. Then we'll define, remember, omega for us is uh, powers of little omega. Yeah? So we'll define t at the point omega to the s to be the product of all the evaluations of f from 0 to s. Yeah, so this is what I like to call a prefix product polynomial, where, let's write it out, you can see t of omega is equal to f of 1 times f of omega. t of omega squared is f of 1 times f of omega times f of omega squared, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so um, up to t to the omega to the power of k minus 1, which actually is the product of, of over all the elements in the set capital omega. Okay, so T basically is again a prefix product in the sense that every point in T on the set omega defines a prefix, uh, well, defines the product up to that point of, po of uh, polynomials, of uh, evaluations of F. Everybody okay on what this T is? Yeah, it's a prefix product polynomial. Um, that's what we define. And now um, you notice there's a very important, this T can actually, has a very important property. In particular, it could be defined recursively. It satisfies a recursive um, property which says that T at the point omega times X, yeah, so X shifted to the next element in the subgroup, so omega times X, is equal to TX times F of omega times X, right? We take the previous prefix, multiply it by the current value of F, and that gives us the next prefix. Next prefix product, yeah? And that turns out to be true for every x and omega, and it takes a moment of thought to see it is even true if we plug in x, which is the very last point in omega. x equals omega to the k minus 1. Things will wrap around, but if the statement is true, this equality will hold even, uh, even at that point. Okay, so we have this auxiliary polynomial that satisfies this nice recurrence, and now if you scratch your heads for a minute, you realize, oh, this is kind of cool. This is a recurrence, this is a, a polynomial identity, its degree is just, uh, what is it, k plus d, right? This is degree k, this is degree d, so the degree of this identity is at most k plus d. Great, so we have a low degree polynomial identity here, which we know how to, which we can prove using our zero test. And that's exactly what we're gonna do in just a second. So there's a very simple lemma that you can prove that basically says, if the recurrence relation holds on all of omega, you, you see here, I just wrote the recurrence relation as, uh, as a zero test, yeah, I just moved things to the other side so we can write the recurrence relation as, in terms of a zero test. This, this polynomial on the, on the left here has to be zero for all, of, all x in omega. And it so happens that if I evaluate t at the very last point, omega to the k minus 1, this is the full product, right? This is the complete product. If that's equal to 1, then in fact the product test is equal to 1. Yeah, so again, what's happening here is the recurrence relation is proving that all the prefixes are correct, the prefix products are correct, and then this, con this first condition proves that the full prefix evaluates to one, which is exactly what we wanted. Does this make sense to everyone? Yeah? Cool. Well, so given this lemma, now you should be able to see what the protocol is. So let's actually write out the actual uh, product check protocol. So what, the way the protocol works is, again, the prover has a polynomial f, the verifier has a commitment to the polynomial. We're going to define our, uh, our polynomial t, just like we did before, and I'll, deno I'll, I'll use t1 to be the recurrence relation, right? So here, I just wrote down the recurrence relation, t omega x minus tx times f omega x. So here, t1 is just a re this recurrence relation. And we know that this recurrence relation is supposed to hold on all of omega, so t1x is supposed to be zero on all of capital omega. Great. So let's do our zero test. So we're going to define the quotient polynomial to be t1 divided by x to the k minus 1. This is the vanishing polynomial of omega. Yeah, Q, qx is now supposed to be a polynomial if, in fact, t1 is zero on all of omega. And now what the prover will do is it will commit to t and q. So t, remember, remember was the prefix product polynomial. Q is this proof that a t1 is zero on all of omega. And now the verifier is just going to do the usual thing. We just do this over and over again. We're going to evaluate. We're going to verify identity relations by verifying them at a random point. So we send a random point to the, to the prover. Uh, the, so we query. Now we have to query at a, at a bunch of points. Yeah? To use the lemma, we have to query the polynomial t at uh, omega to the k minus 1 because we have to verify that's equal to 1. And then we have to evaluate it at r and omega r because that's what it takes 
to evaluate T1, right? To evaluate T1, we need to evaluate it at R and at omega R. And then Q, we're gonna evaluate at R, and then F, we're gonna evaluate at omega R. So here, the verifier will learn all these values on the right here, and then it will accept, basically, if the conditions of the lemma hold, right? So T is equal to one, and the recurrence relation happens to be zero on all of uh, capital omega. You, you see here, this is literally just testing the first condition of, a lem of the lemma is that the full prefix product is equal to one. The second condition of the lemma is that the recurrence holds for all x and omega. This is just a zero. All I wrote here is just a zero test. I just wrote down the zero test uh, explicitly. Yeah, so you can see five, uh, by doing five evaluations, we can actually prove that the product check actually, actually works. Yeah? Why we are even query the uh, omega to the power k minus one? That we expect that we will get one because there is no, so we just need to check if the uh, value that the prover committed into, like when he committed to C and Q, is the uh, value of commitment from, uh, of one. Well, the prover is committing to a polynomial, it's not committing to a value. So how do you know that the polynomial evaluates to one at this point? So, in this case, uh, how do I know that he really sent me the value, not just one? Because, like, when I'm the... Oh, remember, the prover is sending you evaluation proofs. When I say query, that means the prover is sending you the evaluations along with evaluation proofs to prove that these are correct evaluations. Okay. Yeah, so you know, if, you, if the prover tells you the t of omega to the k minus one is equal to one, you are guaranteed that that actually is what the committed polynomial satisfies. Cool, and I'll tell you, this is an unoptimized version. There's a lot of ways to optimize this. Here's another homework assignment. Um, here's a very cute thing about polynomial commitments. Suppose I have a committed polynomial f, and I wanna open that polynomial at five different points. Yeah, the homework assignment for you is to show that that can be reduced into opening one polynomial at one point. Yeah, it's kinda cool that I can open a polynomial, a committed polynomial at many, as many points as I want by just opening a single polynomial at one point. Yeah, so you can see, for example, here we have to open T at two points. That's actually not really there. That's really just opening it at one point. So there's, like I said, lots of optimizations. This is an unoptimized version. I just wanted to write the simplest version that I can kind of explain to you how this works, but there's lots and lots and lots of ways to optimize this. In fact, this can all be reduced into a, into a, a single commitment and a single opening. Cool. Okay, so uh, what do we know about this? Uh, as usual, I have to say that, uh, yeah, so the proof size is just two commitments, five evaluations. The verifier time, you realize the verifier, all it's doing is just the only hard part for the verifier. It's kind of funny, even though we wrote all these steps, the only hard part for the verifier is computing r to the k minus one. <laughs> yeah, all the work that the verifier has to do is to evaluate r to the k minus one. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so the verifier time is uh, log k, and as usual, I have to argue, I have to explain that this is a public coin protocol, so it can be made non-interactive using fiat chimera. So this is a non-interactive proof, constant size, constant size, uh, well, actually, I should say, if the polynomial commitment has constant size evaluation proofs, this is a constant size proof that the product check holds. I, I, you, sh you should kind of be surprised that this is at all possible. Yeah, that I can prove to you that a huge degree polynomial has this, satisfies this crazy product formula, using, you know, just two commitments and, and, and what is it, five openings. It's like constant size proof convinces you that the relation actually holds. Everybody with me? Is this, am I going, is this, am I going too fast, too slow? Everybody okay? Too slow, too slow. Too slow. <laughs> I see, yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> no, please, if I go too fast, please ask questions and I'll slow down. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually very proud of the fact that my students told me that they cannot, what, they cannot speed up my recordings. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's a point of pride for me. <laughs> yeah, um, good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, the, power, the omega said that omega is always a multiplicative, multiplicative subgroup. That's just the most efficient thing to use. Yeah. Um, well, oh, never say always, but by, by and large, it's a, it's a multiplicative subgroup. Yeah, good. Any other, any other questions? Um, yeah, please. Uh, what is the proof of complexity? Yeah, the prover basically just has the hardest thing for the prover. Well, it has to compute the polynomial T, the prefix product polynomial, but that's linear time. Yeah, it's just a, a bunch of, well, you have to be careful. It has to evaluate the polynomial F at K points. 
So again, it depends on how f is represented exactly. It could be either linear or quasi-linear. Then it has to compute T1, again, either linear or quasi-linear, and then it has to compute the quotient, again, linear or quasi-linear. So in the, worst, in, in the worst case, this will take, k, this will take the prover k log k times, or d log d times, I should say. Yep. So still almost linear, almost linear. Cool, it's a good question. Okay, so let's continue. So we have our basic building blocks, um, zero test, sum check, and product check. By the way, homework assignment for you is to do the sum check. Don't forget. Um, does anybody see how to do sum check? Do you want to shout it out? Or it's the same idea, actually. You know, instead of prefix product, you use prefix sum. Yeah, you just have T be the prefix sum polynomial, and you get, and you get a sum check. Okay, so the next gadgets we have to look at are uh, what are called um, uh, permutation checks, okay? So here's a cute, cute question for you. So suppose uh, the verifier has two committed polynomials, F and G, and what the prover wants to convince the verifier is that if we write out all the evaluations of F, yeah, so over all of capital omega, we write out the evaluations of F as a vector, and we write out all the evaluations of G as a vector, then one vector is a permutation of another vector. Yeah, so F, so G of omega is a vector, is just a permutation of, of F of omega. So let me ask you, does anybody, does this sound familiar? Does anybody know how to do these kind of checks? Um, well, yeah, please. Yeah, that's essentially the Planck permutation argument. It's, it's no, 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 this is not the Planck, this is a baby, this is a baby permutation argument. This is a, just to prove that one vector is a permutation of another. This is not the, the permutation argument. We'll get there in just a second. Okay, so, yeah, please. Product check? Wait, what, uh, product check, I mean, you're, what, we're gonna take a product over the vector? No, if two products are equal, that doesn't mean that the vectors are equal. That doesn't mean that the vectors are product of permutations of one another. Let me show you, in the interest of time, let me show you. So this is a standard, standard, standard trick. Uh, it's called the Lipton trick from 1989, which basically says if you wanna test if two sets or two vectors are equal to one another, what you do is you define these auxiliary polynomials. You define a polynomial f hat and g hat, which basically have as their roots the elements of the vector. You see, so f hat is basically a polynomial of degree k, it's whose roots are exactly the elements of the vector. And then you define a polynomial g hat, and we know that if g is a permutation of f, it must be that f hat is equal to, the, to g hat, because they have the same set of roots, okay? So, well, how do we check if two polynomials are equal to one another? We evaluate them at the random point. This, by the way, this is a recurrent theme. How do we check the two things are equal? We evaluate at the random point. It's always, always the same thing. Um, okay, so the protocol would work by sending a random point to the prover. The prover will, um, uh, what? The prover, is, the prover now needs to prove that f, of f hat r is equal to g hat r. But f hat r, f hat and g hat, these are complicated polynomials. Yeah, f hat and g hat, g hat, they're defined as some crazy products, right? But fortunately, we have a product check. And so what this boils down to is proving, the way we're gonna prove that f hat r is equal to g hat r, is we're gonna prove that f hat r divided by g hat r is equal to one, yeah? And f hat r over g hat r is basically a product of this, basically these quotients. Yeah, so this basically is um, uh, uh, proving a product check property on a polynomial where the little r is replaced by the variable capital X, right? So it's a, it's a polynomial in one variable, capital X, little r is replaced by capital X, and we just wanna prove, uh, sorry, little, not little r, sorry, uh, not little r, little a is replaced by capital X. R is fixed. Little a is replaced by capital X, and we wanna prove that as we take a product over all a in omega, this is equal to one. Yeah, so this is exactly, exactly a product check. And so, uh, yeah, so if the product check says that this product is equal to one, we know that f hat is equal to g hat, and therefore the verifier can accept. Okay, so this shows how a product check gives us a simple permutation check. Any questions on this? Yeah, please. If I can, the product check only for the polynomial. Excellent, excellent. I was so, so happy you asked us. Excellent. So, Right, I showed you, showed you that the product check is only for polynomials, and here we're applying a product check to rational functions. Okay, third homework assignment. Generalize the product check to rational functions. It's really quite straightforward, uh, and it's basically the same protocol. Yeah, so, so you're getting a lot of homework assignments here. Um, 
but yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's basically the same protocol. Yeah? Why can't you use a zero test? A zero test on what? Like uh, F hat R, I mean F hat minus uh, G hat. And, okay, and how do you evaluate F hat? Well, evaluating F hat requires K, requires this crazy product. Because we don't know how, because evaluating F hat is, is a little tricky, we're just going to use, well, basically evaluating F hat evaluates to a product check, right? So we might as well use the product check that we have. Yeah, but that's basically what we're doing. You're, you're absolutely right. Cool, all right? So we're making progress. So we can make, we can, t we can test permutations. So we can test that one polynomial is a permutation of another polynomial. Turns out that's not quite enough for what we want. Uh, we need one more gadget. And the gadget, that's the permutation check. The gadget is what's called a prescribed permutation check, where not only do I want to check if f is a permutation of g, I want to check whether f is a prescribed permutation of g. Okay, so let's say that we have another uh, polynomial w, and this w implements a permutation. So what does it mean for w to implement a permutation? Well, you know, w at one point in capital omega happens to map to another cap point in capital omega, and that mapping is a bijection. Yeah, so for example, you know, w0 could be omega to the 0 gets mapped to omega squared, omega to the 1 gets mapped to omega to the 0, omega squared gets mapped to omega to the 1, and that would be our, our polynomial w. Yeah, so this polynomial implements a fixed permutation on the set capital omega. And what we want to prove, what the prover wants to prove, is that f and g, so the, the, sorry, the verifier has commitments to f, to g, and to the permutation w, and the prover wants to prove that f of omega is actually g of omega permuted by this w. Yeah, so we want to have a, prove a, a prescribed permutation. And if you think about what that translates to, is basically checking that f of y is equal to g at the point wy, right? We're permuting the input to g, and they should, the equality should still hold, and they should hold for all y in omega. So that's what we'd like to prove. So far so good? So it's a, that would prove a prescribed permutation on, on the vector. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, this actually, if you look at it for a minute, this sounds like we already know how to do this. Yeah, this sounds like equality of, this is equality of polynomials. How do we test if two polynomials are equal? We evaluate at a random point. We can all, almost all sing this together now. Right, we evaluate at a random point and, and that should prove that these two polynomials are equal. Great, so we can use a zero test on this polynomial, except that runs into a problem. This doesn't work. Yeah. But uh, G composed of W is not polynomial, right? No, no, G, W is a polynomial, G is a, yeah, W is a polynomial, oh, I didn't, I didn't, oh, sorry, I didn't say that, oh, yeah, 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 W is a polynomial, W is a polynomial, yes, yes, thank you. You compose the commitment, you can take a commute to G and W and get a commitment to G of W? No, 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 that you can't do. Well, no, no, but you can still evaluate at a random point. What you'll do is you'll evaluate W at a random point, you'll get W of R, and then you'll ask to evaluate G at the point W of R. So you can still evaluate a random point, but there's a problem. There's a big problem. The degree of the um, exactly. The problem is the problem is that um, this this polynomial that we would like to do a zero test on, unfortunately, this has degree at least k squared. Technically, it has degree k times d. Yeah, but let's say k squared. So it's a quite right. If I start combining, composing two degree k polynomials, I end up with a polynomial of degree k squared. Yeah. That's okay, maybe that's not the end of the world because we don't have to explicitly commit. We can just commit to W and separately we can com com commit to G. Where we run into trouble is where the pro when the prover needs to compute the quotient polynomial. Now to compute the quotient polynomial, the poor prover has to manipulate polynomials of quadratic degree. That, that would lead to a quadratic time prover. And that's like a no-no in the space. That's like, not, that's like uh, not allowed, completely not allowed in the space. If we end up with a quadratic time prover, we can only prove very, very, very small statements. Yeah, in fact, I would say that the big breakthrough in 2013 that enabled modern snarks to emerge is the ability to move from a quadratic time prover to a linear time prover. This is why now we can handle circuits of size 2 to the 20, 2 to the 30. With quadratic time provers, there is no hope of handling such large circuits. So no, 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 we can't deal with quadratic time uh, provers. So we have to do something else in order to, um, uh, to do the permutation check, the prescribed permutation check without dealing, with quadratic, without dealing with quadratic degree polynomials. And this, I have to say, is a really clever trick. 
Unfortunately, I don't have time to show you. So I'll t just tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just tell you that there's a very, very clever trick that literally reduces this to a product check on polynomials of degree 2k, not k squared. And if, I'll give you a hint, and you can try to work it out for yourself. If not, you can look it up. It's, there's a lot of places. You can even look in the slides. In the slides, I think I have the, the full constructions at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, basically, I'll tell you what happens is it literally reduces to a very similar problem to just what we saw, to proving that one polynomial is a permutation of the other. But it's a, it's, a, it's a permutation now on pairs rather than singletons, and that reduces to a bivariate product check. Yeah, so maybe that's a hint to help you think, uh, to think about this, but um, I'm not going to describe that, that here. So just know that we can do a prescribed permutation check also using a very, very cute uh, trick. Uh, yeah, yeah, question? So assuming the these permutations come from the circuit eventually, yeah. isn't it enough to focus on a, a small family of Ah. Then they argue that uh, you know it's it does enough to render every circuit and uh, speed up things. You know the permutation check. It turns out to be sufficiently efficient that that doesn't matter. <laughs> we can do it for arbitrary permutations, like focusing on specific ones. Not necessarily. It's not going to necessarily improve things. Yeah. Um, but it's a very, it's, yeah. It's an interesting idea. Um, but yeah, this the the permutation check is already simple enough. <laughs> That I'm, I'm not sure if that, that would help. Yeah, very interesting idea. OK, so uh, just to summarize, basically, these are, the, these are the gadgets we looked at and the kind of tower that's being built here. So I like to present things in a modular way. So we started with polynomial equality testing, uh, evaluated at a random point. Uh, from that, we built a zero test by proving that the quotient, that the quotient polynomial is um, a polynomial itself. From that, we built a product check and a sum check using these prefix uh, polynomials. Um, from the product check, we built a permutation check and a prescribed permutation check. Yeah, so we have uh, all these gadgets that, uh, that we can do. And by the way, there are lots and lots and lots of little gadgets like this um, that you can, if you're ever teaching this to students, there's like infinitely many homework problems you can generate like this because there are lots and lots and lots of gadgets you can do, very cute, very cute and clever algebraic tricks for how to prove certain things in constant time. Constant proof size, constant time for the verifier. Okay, so those are all the gadgets we need. So let's remember, let's take a let's pause for a minute and remember all the gadgets that we have. And now let's roll up our sleeves and build our actual snark system. So I wanna, what I wanna show you is the, the Plonk snark, but what I'm gonna show you, to, I'm gonna, the way I'm gonna describe it is just as an IOP. So we're gonna assume an underlying, um, an underlying polynomial commitment scheme, which we don't care which one it is, any polynomial commitment scheme will work. And we'll describe, uh, we'll describe Planck just as an interactive oracle proof that uses the underlying polynomial commitment scheme. Yeah, so here I have a link to the Planck paper. It's a beautiful paper by uh, Gabizon, Williamson, et al. Um, and so let's describe how the scheme works. Before that, I guess I, I just wanted to say that this construction is used quite heavily uh, in practice as an IOP. In particular, you can take the abstract protocol, the abstract interactive oracle proof, and you can instantiate it with one polynomial commitment scheme, like KZG, and then you get systems like Aztec and Jellyfish that uh, these are implementations of Plunk instantiated using uh, the KZG commitment scheme. You can instantiate if you want with bulletproofs. Yeah, remember that, that that's a commitment scheme, polynomial commitment scheme that doesn't require pairings, it works on any elliptic curve group, and then you get an instantiation called Halo2, which actually today has a, a slow verifier, hopefully that will be fixed in the future, and requires no trusted setup. Or, as Ellie said, we also get a com commitment scheme from FRI. You can instantiate with FRI, and then you get Plunky2 or Redshift. Again, these are systems that now are, um, requires no, no trusted setup, and are even post-quantum secure. Yeah, so we have, uh, but of course, as, again, as we saw in the last lecture, they actually generate proofs that are potentially like 100 kilobytes. Yeah, so lar larger proofs but everything, uh, everything else is still quite good. So you can see that the system has been instantiated many, many, many times using different polynomial equipment schemes, and you end up with different, uh, different practical real-world systems that people like to use. Yeah? So far so good? Okay, so uh, the slides are public, by the way, so uh, they're all available to you. Okay, so uh, with that, let's go look at how Plonk actually works. And my claim is that this is actually quite direct. Now that we have our gadgets, it, there's actually not much to do. So I'm hoping I can do this in 10 minutes, but we'll see, we'll see how long it actually takes. So let's dive right in. Well, so we start with a circuit. So here's our favorite arithmetic circuit. Yeah, so, um, uh, well, you know, it's some arithmetic circuits. Um, it has fan and gates have fan in of two. 
And we want to prove that we have a witness. Oh, sorry, sorry. I need to say there are two public inputs, x1 and x2. And there's one secret input, w1. It has three inputs overall. Two are public. One is secret. OK, so now let's, try, let's go ahead and, and build uh, a snark out of it. The first step is the arithmetization, the arithmetization step. Oh, here, I actually wrote down the actual, all the numbers for you. So the output of the gate, the input is 5, 6, 1. The output of the circuit is 77 on that input. So the first step is the arithmetization step, where we literally write down the computation trace. OK, so we write out our inputs, so 5, 6, and 1. And then we write the inputs for gate number 0. Yeah, the left input, the right input, and the output. Then we do the same thing for gate number 1. Left input, right input, and output for gate number 2. And the final output of the circuit, of course, is the output of the final gate in the circuit. Yeah, so we moved from a, from a circuit and an input to the circuit into a computation trace, which is this, just a table of values of, of the, the individual gates. Yeah. Why are we talking about secret inputs now? I mean, we're not talking secret. No, no, no. I, I, meant, I meant witness inputs. Uh, we're just trying, trying to prove, the, the prover is trying to prove that it knows a witness that makes the circuit a value to zero. Thank you. I shouldn't have used the word secret. It's just a, uh, uh, yeah, it's just a witness, a witness input. It's exactly right. By the way, uh, I'll, I'll say at the end that this can actually be made into a ZK snark relatively, in a rel just by adding some blinding, so relatively straightforward. Okay, so far so good. So we can move from circuits to tables, tables of values. Okay, and all we want to do is prove that the output of the table is, uh, is 77. So let me introduce a little bit of notation that I need. So C is the total number of gates in the circuit. I'm going to uh, write for I, the size of I is going to be the total number of inputs. In our case, I was equal to 3. But I'm going to say, I'm going to break it down into I sub X, which is the public inputs. In our case, that was 2. And I sub W, which is the secret witness, which in our case was 1. So 2 plus 1 is equal to 3. And let's define D to be 3 times the number of gates plus the total number of inputs. This is the degree of the polynomial that we need. In our example, it was 3 times 3. Uh, yeah, 3 times 3 gates plus 3 inputs gives us D equals 12. And so omega is going to be a subgroup of size 12. Could be bigger if we want, but let's just uh, make omega be um, a subgroup of size 12. Okay? Good. So now what, what, what's our plan? What's the plan of attack? The plan of attack is just to do what we always do. Right? What we'll do is we'll find some polynomial T that basically will interpolate this entire table. Okay? So T at different point, evaluated at different points in omega will evaluate to different points in this table. So it's going to encode this one polynomial is going to encode the entire trace. And then we have to prove somehow that the encoding is a valid computation trace and that its output is 77. Yeah, that's what we have to do. So let's see how. So all I'm gonna, so now it becomes a little kind of just mechanical. There's like nothing much going on. This is literally mechanical of how do you encode a computation trace as a polynomial, and then how do you prove that the computation trace is a valid computation trace? So let's see. So the plan is gonna be as follows. We have our polynomial T. The first thing we'll do is we'll encode all the inputs, and just for convenience, I'll encode the inputs on, ne on negative powers of omega. Yeah, just, this is just a con notational convenience. So, you know, the first input will be at omega minus 1, the second input will be at omega minus 2, and so on and so forth, right? So for j equals 1 to i, we use omega to the minus j for input number j. Great. Now, the gates will, again, just encode them in the same way. So we'll say, you know, for l goes from 0 to c minus 1, omega to the 3l will be the left input of gate number l, 3l plus 1 will be the right input, and 3l plus 2 will be the output of gate number l. Okay, so let's, let's, we just literally, we have a table. Uh, we use omega to the minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3 to denote the inputs. And we use uh, all the positive powers of omega to denote, to encode the rest of the table. So that's our polynomial T. So again, to be super concrete, I let, just wrote down all the constraints here. Yeah, so that's, we have, what is it? We have 12 constraints in the polynomial. So 12 constraints define a polynomial of degree 11. So we end up with a polynomial of degree 11. So far, so good. In practice, by the way, uh, you know, if we have like circuits with a million gates in them, we'll end up with polynomials of degree like three million or so. Yeah. So these, in practice, these are all pretty massive, massive polynomials. Okay. Um, yeah. And now we have to do. Oh, I, I guess this just says that using FFTs, you know, number theory transforms, we can actually interpolate this polynomial and get its coefficients. If we want to, we can get the coefficients of t quite efficiently only in quasi-linear time in the total degree. 
Great. So now we have to prove uh, validity that this, is, this polynomial encodes a valid computation trace. So the prover, again, is going to commit to the polynomial T. And there are four things we have to prove about the polynomial. These four things will prove it's a valid computation trace. The first thing we have to do is prove that T encodes the correct inputs. Yeah, so the T at the negative powers evaluates to 5, 6, and 1, correct inputs. Next thing we have to do is we have to prove that every gate was evaluated correctly, right? So if it's an addition gate, it's an addition. If it's a multiplication gate, it's a multiplication. And the last thing we have to do, or actually the third thing we have to do, is we have to implement all the wiring. We have to prove that the wiring is implemented correctly. So what do I mean by wiring? Right, you can see here that input number two happens to be the right input to gate number zero and the left input to gate number one, right? So we have to prove that all the copy constraints are correctly satisfied um, using, the, which are basically encoded by the wiring. And finally, we have to prove that the last output, that the, the output of the last gate is whatever the verifier ex ex expects. Here at 77, in general, it will be zero. So there are four things we have to prove. Four things we have to prove, and let's walk through them one by one. I claim that the fourth one is trivial. Right, the fourth one, all we're gonna do is we're gonna just ask the prover to open the polynomial at the point omega to the 3c minus one, which is the output of the last gate, and we're gonna check that the output is zero. So the fourth thing is easy. So we have three things left to do. We have to prove that the inputs are correct, we have to prove that the gates were computed correctly, and we have to prove that the wiring was done correctly. That's it. Yeah? Uh, when three appears here and on the previous slides, does it really is uh, fun in degree of a gate? Yeah, yeah, that, the three, exactly. Three is because these are gates of fan and two. Yeah, the, I know, it's two plus one. Two plus one. The exactly, exactly. Yeah, so in the general case, we can uh, like change three into this. Ooh, I will blow your mind even more. In the general case, who says we have to restrict ourselves to addition and multiplication gates? Maybe we can have even more general gates than additions and multiplications. And in fact, that's quite useful in practice. Yeah, so not only we have to, we don't have to restrict the fan in, we can even have more general gates, and we'll get to that uh, at the end, towards the end of the talk. Great. Okay, so uh, let's do it. So how do we prove that the inputs are encoded correctly? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to ask the verifier to interpolate its own polynomial. So the verifier will interpolate a polynomial that, it's a polynomial V, its degree is going to be equal to the number of public inputs. In our example, that was equal to two. So the, the, the polynomial will just be, uh, you know, at the point omega to the minus j, it will evaluate to input number j, yeah? And so in our example, you can see v is a polynomial with two constraints, so v is a linear polynomial, and, and the verifier is allowed to do this. Remember, the verifier is allowed to run in linear time, in, or, you know, it's polynomial time in the size of the input, okay? Because it has to read the input, so it has to work in polynomial time in the size of the input. Here, the only thing it has to do is interpolate this polynomial, and that it's allowed to do this. It has enough time to interpolate this, this V. Okay, and so the next thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna prove that the polynomial T of, the polynomial T is equal to the polynomial V for all the omegas that correspond to input points. Yeah, so for all Y in omega input, here I wrote down what omega input is here. It's basically all the points that correspond to the public inputs. You know, TY should be equal to VY. This is just a zero test. Yeah, it's a very simple zero test that uh, the verifier and the prover can do and uh, can do efficiently. Yeah, so that takes care of the inputs. Yeah. But it's just opening both sides. No, 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 zero test. No, 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 no. Zero test, you have to compute a quotient polynomial, then you have to open the quotient polynomial at a random point. The zero test is a whole protocol. Yeah, so here, we, this is just literally a zero test on the set omega imp. Do you think we need omega to be a Excellent, excellent, thank you. I was waiting for someone to ask, excellent. So for this to be an efficient proof, um, remember the verifier has to evaluate the vanishing polynomial of the set. So the verifier has to be able to evaluate the vanishing polynomial of omega imp, but it's allowed to do it in linear time in the size of the input. And in fact, by definition, evaluating the vanishing polynomial at ome of omega imp at a random point is linear, linear time in the size of the input. So the verifier has enough time to do this zero test. Yeah? Yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah, the interpolate, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, you, it turns out you actually don't, you end up not needing to interpolate. If you think about what the verifier actually needs to do, the verifier, all it has to do is it has to write out the the polynomial in point value form. So it, it has the 
evaluations of this polynomial at x points, yeah? And then it has to, from that, it has to evaluate the polynomial at a random point. Turns out there is a, there is a uh, barycentric formula that allows you to go from a point value form to an evaluation of a point of a polynomial at a random point in linear time. You never actually have to write down the polynomial in coefficient form. Yeah. So this actually, this zero test will only take linear time to evaluate V at a random point. Yeah, this is, by the way, a very cute trick, which, uh, this is a very cute trick, which, which um, I, I always find is very annoying. If you look at algorithms books, uh, sorry, I have to go on a tangent here for a minute. If you look at algorithms book, books, the motivation for FFT is I give you a polynomial, a, a polynomial in point value form, and I want you to evaluate the polynomial at a random point. The motivation in algorithms books, the motivation for FFT is we use FFT to go to, um, go to coefficient form and then evaluate the polynomial in linear time. You don't need to do that. The barycentric formula, barycentric formula will let you evaluate the polynomial at a random point in linear time and there's no need for an FFT for that. Yeah, so keep that in mind. Cool, all right, so we're done with inputs. The next thing we have to do is we have to make sure the gates are evaluated correctly. So how do we make sure the gates are evaluated correctly? Well, we're gonna use what's called a selector polynomial. The selector polynomial is going to be, uh, uh, for every, for gate number L, it's gonna evaluate to one if it's an addition gate, and it's gonna evaluate to zero if it's a multiplication gate. So the selector polynomial just chooses whether it's an addition gate, whether gate number L is addition or multiplication, and again, I wrote down the, you know, in our case, gate zero was addition, gate one was addition, and gate two was multiplication. So you can see here, the selector polynomial is literally one, one, zero. Okay, is this clear for everyone? One, one, zero uh, defines uh, what the addition, what the gates actually uh, need to do. And now that we have that, really, uh, to make sure that the gates are evaluated correctly, here, let's, let's just look, look at this crazy formula. What this says is that for every gate, if we look, if, the, if S, of, S of Y, let's say S of Y is equal to one, then the one minus S of Y term goes away, so we're left with just S of Y times the addition, so we're adding the left input and the right input. If S of Y is equal to zero, the addition term goes away, it disappears, we're left with the multiplication gate, and here we're multiplying the left input and the right input, and that should be equal to the output. Yeah, so this selector polynomial basically ensures that if this equality holds for all y in omega gates, then all the additions and multiplications were done correctly. Yeah, so whenever the selector is equal to one, we're enforcing an addition constraint. Whenever the selector is equal to zero, we're enforcing a multiplication constraint. Does everybody see how this work works? Yeah, it's either the left term or the right term is activated. The left term implements additions, the right, terms, the right term implements multiplication. So far, so good. How do we how do we use this? Well, the way we we would use this is our fancy setup procedure, right? So the setup. Remember the pre-processing procedure. We're allowed to pre-process the circuit. The pre-process the trusted pre-processing. Before Benny asks me, this is a trusted pre-processing procedure that is going to basically commit to um, to the selector polynomial. This just encodes what the gates in the circuit actually do. And then, uh, and once we do this, basically the prover will commit to uh, the, the polynomial T, and then they'll use a zero test to prove that this equality holds for all the Y that represent gates. Yeah, so this crazy polynomial happens to equal to zero, it's just another zero test. So we didn't do anything particularly crazy there, it's just another zero test to argue that all the gates are evaluated correctly. Yeah? So you don't really gain by using the polynomial you can never trust the setup. No, no, this is not a trusted setup. There was nothing trusted here. This, anyone can recompute the commitment and verify that it was done correctly. It's not a trusted setup. This is not a trusted setup because anyone, you know, you commit, you, 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 you run the pre-processing process, you produce the commitment to S, but if you don't trust the pre-processor guy, just rerun the pre-processing procedure and you'll get the same commitment to S. Yeah, here we're assuming we're using deterministic polynomial commitments. Yeah. And so there's nothing trusted about this, uh, this, uh, this VP. You can always verify for yourself that the commitment is, in fact, a commitment to the correct selector polynomial. No, but, but if you do that, then you're paying uh, the cost of the circuit, right? You're not, you no longer... No, 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 no. This is all done in the pre-processing phase. Sure. So pre-processing is allowed to run... Yeah, pre-processing is allowed... In fact, pre-processing has to run in linear time in the size of the circuit. Yeah. Otherwise, nobody's reading the circuit. <laughs> yeah, somebody has to read the circuit. You're trusting, you're assuming somebody will verify. Yeah, that's right. You trust, the verifier basically is trusting that this has been done and has been verified. Exactly. That's exactly right. 
Terrific. So now we have verified all the gates. We have one last thing to verify, and that's that the wiring is done correctly. So this is actually a very cute trick. This is uh, the fact that the wiring is done correctly is a very, very nice observation. So again, here we have to prove, for example, that uh, this equality relation is about T. Here I literally wrote down what this equality is. For the first, for the first input, for, or rather for the second input, you know, 11 and 11 have to be, these two 11s have to be equal. And that's kind of, I wrote down all the equalities that are needed to be satisfied. So how do we prove that all these equalities are satisfied? These are like, these equalities are defined by the wires of the circuit. So how do we prove that all these equalities are satisfied in constants, in using just constants, uh, proofs, using constant proof size? Um, well, so the, the cute idea is to say that um, we are going to define a, a permutation, W, that implements a rotation of all these constraints. Just ro rotate one step to the, to the right, yeah? So here, literally, uh, you can see this implements a rotation of the first cycle. This is a cycle, that we have four cycles here. Each, this W implements a rotation of each one of the cycles. And then the lemma basically says that if in fact T is invariant on this, on, under this rotation, that means that all these equalities are satisfied. Yeah, this is just a moment's reflection. We'll show you that that's true. If you have invariance under a rotation of all these, uh, of all these cycles, then the equality, then the, all these equalities have to be satisfied. So boom, in one step, we can check all these equalities by encoding it, by encoding the equalities using, uh, using this permutation. And somebody tell me, how do we check that this equality down here holds, that T of Y is equal to D of WI? Yeah, that was exactly one of our gadgets. Prove that we proved this using up the prescribed permutation check. That was one of our gadgets. Yeah, so that's, that's a pretty cute trick, actually. I have to say, this, this is kind of these things that make you happy to see. That's like a you know, very, very cute uh, trick to, to, test immediate, to test in one test that all the, all, the wire, all the wiring constraints are actually satisfied using this permutation check. Yeah, so now we can show the entire Planck. So the way this works is the pre-processing uh, procedure is going to commit to the gate selector polynomial. It's going to commit to the permutation that implements all the wiring constraints. As I said, this is untrusted because you can always verify that that was done correctly, okay? And then basically the prover will commit to the polynomial T, which is the transcript of the computation. And now it'll prove to the verifier that all the four things hold, right? That the gate, the gate zero test works, the input zero test is correct, the wiring zero test is correct, and that the last output, the last gate, happens to output zero. You just do these four things one at a time. And you end up, you, re, you see each one of these was a constant size proof. So you end up with a constant size proof overall. And again, this is unoptimized, you can, you can compress all of this. I think it boils down to like, um, oh sorry, there's a theorem basically that says that this is complete and knowledge sound, this is in the paper. Uh, all you need is basically the, num the number of gates divided by P should be negligible, and this will be complete and knowledge sound. And uh, you realize that um, everything was constant, so all we need to do here is uh, we just need to have a constant number of commitments, the verifier just runs in constant time, and, uh, and that's it. Okay, so I see that I need to finish, so I'll just do my last, last point and then I'll finish which is that who says that we have to stick to addition and multiplication gates? We can actually define much more general constraints in, this, in the sense that once we have our, our computation trace, we can define kind of arbitrary constraints on the computation trace, right? So here I wrote down a funny uh, relation that would have to be satisfied at every row of the computation. It doesn't have to, have to be even a constraint on rows. It could be constraints between rows if we wanted to. Yeah, so these are very general um, uh, uh, constraints, uh, constraints on the computation trace. This is called uh, Planckish arithmetization. Mary is gonna talk a, a lot more about that uh, tomorrow. By including a selector polynomial, you can even make sure that these are only applied to some rows and not to other rows. So there's a lot of flexibility in doing, in doing all of this. And the reason we do this is so that we can shrink the computation trace. The more power we give our computing model, the smaller the computation trace becomes, and that speeds up the prover. So the reason we want to have more power is to end up with um, uh, faster and faster provers. So uh, that's it. I think uh, this is kind of my whirlwind explanation of Plunk. We constructed a snark from scratch. I hope this was clear, and we are done. <laughs>